in your submersible, um, which has a great name limiting factor, I'd love to hear your uh, comments on that, sure. um, is unique uh, in that it can repeat um, and it has a titanium uh, hull as I understand. But you built that with the same group that built the Titan submersible. That it no, 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 no. Very, very different. Okay. Yeah, that's an important distinction. So the group that I worked with for over five years to design and develop the limiting factor was Triton Submarines. Right. And actually, Triton Submarines and myself were highly critical of OceanGate, okay. which was the company that was designing and building right. a very different type of submersible based off carbon fiber, right. not titanium. And we were warning them that that was a very capricious, unpredictable material, and that while it might survive a couple of dives, that eventually it would fail and they would kill people. Right. And there was a, a lot of negative interaction between all the different parties and the leader of OceanGate, Stockton Rush, just would not listen to reason, we believe. And he was operating in international waters. So yeah. there was nothing we could do to stop him. And two of my friends were on the sub when it imploded. And so, yeah, so that happened. Interesting. Um, and your technology is different, as you said. Yes, and mine's made out of titanium and right. probably cost uh, an order of magnitude more. And we tested it more severely. It was just, it was done the correct way. Right. Even if you just look at the, at the cockpits of the two right. machines, they're quite different. For example, he used an Xbox controller to control his sub. <laughs> okay. I used a repurposed stick from an F-16 fighter. Yeah. That right there tells you the difference in level of technology and reliability and cost. Right. But I had no compunction at all diving a Titanic any number of times, right. did it with no technical issues. So I read where you've mapped a good bit of the ocean floor, and you talked about that a moment ago, and that you spent, not only have you been to the deepest point, but you spent something like four or five hours there. Uh, uh, well, cumulatively, I think I've spent over 24 or 25 hours at the bottom right. of the ocean. The longest I ever spent was four and a quarter hours. So right. that was actually with a Brit named uh, Hamish Harding, who I went to space with. Right. And uh, he, unfortunately, he died the Titanic. Wow. Yeah. I, I, there was a great visual from the article I read about the, that that dive, um, your dive, uh, that that said that uh, you took a break to eat a tuna fish sandwich and some oh, chips always, while you were exploring the, the yeah, depths I, I of was, the ocean. I was once asked by a reporter if I'm superstitious. I said, "Really? I was 20 years in the Navy and operate on the in the, in the ocean. You think I'm superstitious? Just a little." Yeah. So it started a tradition when, on my very first dive to the Challenger Deep, the deepest point in the ocean, I thought it was appropriate. So I took a tuna fish sandwich, some chips. And film director James Cameron, he told me before I made that dive, he said, you know, one thing I wish I had done that you should do is at the end of your dive, just turn everything off, turn off the thrusters, yeah. just hover right above the surface, just relax, take it all in, right. understand where the F you are. Yeah. And I did that. Yeah. And so literally on my, on my first dive to the bottom of the ocean after, you know, almost four hours on the bottom, turned everything off, turned off the thrusters, ate my tuna fish sandwich and just watched the... The bottom of the ocean drift and lived in that moment it was pretty cool it was five or ten minutes there actually was a major scientific aspect of doing that which i didn't realize until later by just sitting there and not having my thrusters on and just focusing on the environment it turned out that i was very slowly drifting the scientists told me there would be no current at the very bottom of the right. ocean it was too deep the water was too dense the energy couldn't get down there but it was unmistakable that I was just ever so slightly drifting. I came back up and I said, yeah, I was drifting. They said, no, you weren't. I said, let's look at the video. Yeah. Yes, I was. Yeah. All right. And the conclusion from that was there was actually water circulating at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which the climatologist didn't fully account for, we believe. Yeah. So that could have impacts on climate models for water circulating into the deepest and coldest parts of our ocean, right. which has to do with heat retention, carbon sequestration, all sorts of things. So even those small moments can end up having significant potential effects. Yeah. One of the sort of disappointing uh, aspects I've read about your journey was that you get to the deepest part of the ocean and there's a plastic bag and candy yeah. wrappers. There were no candy wrappers. That's okay. a good example of how the media will create something out of They did create that. It was in the article. Yeah. yeah. It was published in the BBC yeah. that I saw candy wrappers at the uh, Child's Creek. And that happened because someone accidentally at a PR firm for the people filming the expedition saw that there were candy wrappers at a different trench mm. and they made a mistake and it got into the press release that they released that I never got to look at. 
and then it was republished by the BBC. Right. So it's just an interesting example where in the so-called factual record of history, right. on my first dive, I saw candy wrappers when I continue to insist, no, right. I didn't. I did see a, I did see a piece of human contamination. I never said it was a plastic bag. Right. It looked like plastic. It was definitely man-made because it had lettering on it. Yeah. But I don't know what material it was because I wasn't able to capture it. Right. But that's just an example where whatever you read, right. and I've learned this from <laughs> now firsthand experience sure. and from actually being in a war, that what you read, I've now learned, is often similar to the truth, but not the exact truth.